Hi everyone, today's lecture is on reconstruction. This is a new set of notes and we're going to be looking at how various groups are going to try and reunite the nation as the Civil War has now ended. The overall definition of reconstruction is the process of rebuilding the South and reunifying the Union. And there were various plans for this over time and various incarnations of reconstruction over the period post-Civil War until its end in the 1870s. And it's going to start off with Abraham Lincoln. Um, he is going to push, before actually the Civil War officially ends, for the 13th Amendment to be passed. The 13th Amendment would officially outlaw slavery in the United States. He also drew up a plan for how to deal with the South as the war was ending. He knew that the South was going to have to eventually surrender, and so he wanted to be prepared. And he came up with what was known as the 10% plan. This would require 10% of Southern voters to take an oath of loyalty before that state would be readmitted into the Union. Now that means that all they have to do is swear to be loyal to the United States and uphold the Constitution. There is no punishment for them necessarily for taking up arms against the United States. There is also necessar no, not necessarily any punishment for them uh, seceding. The goal is to bring the South back into the Union as quickly and painlessly as possible. His goal behind this was that he wanted to reunify the country so that we could move on. However, Congress at this time was controlled by radical Republicans, and if you recall from last class's lecture, radical Republicans were extremely prejudiced against the Confederacy. They felt that they needed to be punished for seceding from the Union. And so when they started drafting their plans for Reconstruction, they were much more severe than what Abraham Lincoln, a moderate Republican, was planning on. They required 50% of white males take an ironclad oath of allegiance before that state could even call a constitutional convention to actually join the Union again. Now, what does that mean? That means that these men had to take an oath of allegiance swearing that they had never taken up arms against the United States. That's where the ironclad part comes in. That they absolutely could not have been involved in the war against the United States in any way, shape, or form. To imagine 50% of white males being able to take that oath immediately following the war, it's impossible. No state had 50% of white males that were able to make that oath. And so because of this, it would have taken an entirely new generation of people for them to actually rejoin the Union as a state. So what would happen in the meantime? Congress's plan was that they would be in control of those states, they would run those states, and they would rebuild those states. The other thing that was required under this Wade Davis bill that they had drawn up was that it required states to abolish slavery, or rather to follow the 13th Amendment. Um, it was sent up to Lincoln, and he pocket vetoed it. Now, a pocket veto is basically when the president does not necessarily want to outright veto something because it'll make people upset. But it's a way for him to disapprove of something that he does not fully agree with. And so it's kind of like sticking it in your pocket and forgetting about it. It's like, you know, the $5 bill that you find in your pants, you know, the next time you wash them. Except for in this case, um, this particular bill, once it expires, because all bills have an expiration date, once it expires, that means that Congress would have to go ahead and redraw up the entire bill all over again. And he knew that that wasn't going to happen. And so this was an effective way to kill it off without upsetting the radical Republicans that controlled Congress. Unfortunately for Lincoln, however, on April 14th, 1865, he would be assassinated by the man you see pictured here, John Wilkes Booth. Uh, John Wilkes Booth was a, uh, from a well-known acting family. He was a Southern sympathizer and had a very involved plan to disrupt and overthrow the United States. Now, this is just a few days after the end of the war, after the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. And Abraham Lincoln and his wife went to the theater as kind of a celebration for the ending of the war. And there was a big celebration for the president coming to see this play. John Wilkes Booth knew that was going to happen. And so he and two other men planned to assassinate not only President Lincoln, but the vice president, Andrew Johnson, 
and also the Secretary of State. Um, the plan was to basically overhaul and throw into complete confusion uh, the, the top levels of the United States government and thus be able to allow the South to revive itself and rise back up and continue fighting the war. However, the other two men did not fulfill their part of the plan. One of them just straight up chickened out. The other one got himself too drunk to complete his, uh, complete his part of the plan. And so the only one that was assassinated was Abraham Lincoln. And he was very deeply mourned by the American public. In fact, Abraham Lincoln was so well loved by the people that when his body was going to be transported to his home in Illinois, the American public basically demanded their, uh, their chance to say goodbye to their commander-in-chief, the man that had brought the country through the Civil War. And so this is an image of um, President Lincoln's body being brought down uh, down the street in New York City. And as you can see, this image right here, um, the little circle over here on the left, in that window right there are two small bodies. And this one right here is a six-year-old future president, Theodore Roosevelt, as he watched President Lincoln's body be brought down the street. Theodore Roosevelt was very much moved by this particular moment. And it would be moments like this that helped solidify for him his future abilities where he decided that he wanted to do as much for his country as his, uh, as his hero, Abraham Lincoln, had done. President Lincoln was so greatly mourned by the American public that there were memorials of many kinds. There were songs and stories and also poems. This one in particular written by the transcendentalist Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman, you may recall, is the individual who once told us to yell out a barbaric yop as a sign of our return to our barbaric and, um, and animalistic roots. But in this particular instance, he was mourning the death of President Lincoln. And he does so in a beautiful way that does not directly address the Civil War, but clearly shows the importance of Abraham Lincoln in directing the country towards success in the war and also um, emotionally keeping the nation together and bonding them together as one. O oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting, while follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But, O oh, heart, 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 O oh, the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills. For you, bouquets and ribboned wreaths, for you, the shores are crowding. For you, they call, the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head, it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer, his lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm, he has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells. But I, with mournful tread, walk the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. There are a few key things that I'd like to point out here. First, when he's calling him, O captain, my captain, that particular phrasing is in many ways seen to um, apply to his role as commander-in-chief, um, his role as the head of our army and the deciding factor in our war. Um, the ship that they're discussing is considered to be the United States, um, this idea that is the ship of state, which is a, a common term to, uh, to use in, uh, when discussing um, the country itself. And the prize that we sought um, is going to be the unity of the country to maintain its union. 
This section right here very clearly um, alludes to his assassination where he was shot in the back of the head by um, uh, John Wilkes Booth. And then also we see um, some other uh, allusions to it, um, as well as seeing here at the end some allusions to the ending of the war. Um, the fearful trip being the separation of the country as well as the war itself. The victor ship being that the United States was the victor in the war and the object won, again, is keeping the unity of the country. So as we know, whenever the president dies, the vice president takes over. And in case you have forgotten, the vice president is Andrew Johnson, who was a Southern Democrat. And that is going to be a, an interesting uh, part to his taking over because he is not only going to be of a different political idea than Lincoln had been, but also the fact that he is from the South is going to cause a lot of conflict. Now, Johnson also has to follow in Lincoln's footsteps. He is trying to do what Lincoln would have wanted while trying to also deal with the radical Republicans who are in office that are obviously not going to like probably anything that he has to say. So what he does is he takes in Lincoln's initial 10% plan. Then to make some of the radical Republicans happy, he is going to add in that leading Confederates are going to be disenfranchised. This word meaning that they are going to lose their ability to vote and basically are not going to really be considered citizens of the United States. The other thing is that they would have to protect the rights of freed men. In other words, not only would they have to accept the 13th Amendment, but that they would have to protect the rights of those newly freed slaves. But as I said, because Johnson is a Southern Democrat, they don't trust him in Congress. Um, the radical Republicans do not think that he is going to do what's best for the country. They think that he is going to um, do things that will benefit Southerners, that he's going to be too easy on the South. And um, so they are constantly in conflict during this period. And he really doesn't make his situation that much better. Um, the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, which would have uh, defined citizenship for these freed men, was uh, vetoed by Andrew Johnson. It went back to Congress and they ended up passing it anyway. Um, however, it shows that there is the very clear difference in opinion on how Reconstruction should occur between these two particular groups. And because the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was maybe a little too, um, too easy for states to ignore because um, it was a federal law and so um, some states said, well, it's a federal law, so it doesn't necessarily apply to states that states could come up with their own laws. They decided that there needed to be an amendment that officially established citizenship for these newly freed slaves. And so that's going to be the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment has a very broad definition of citizenship. Um, it basically says anyone born within the United States is a citizen. And that that was going to make it a lot easier for newly freed slaves to be given and protect the rights that they had just gotten. Rights of free speech, rights of freedom of religion, right to live where you want, move where you want, and those types of things. Um, there were some other things such as state and local governments were not allowed to deprive any citizen of the United States of life, liberty, or property without our favorite thing, due process, meaning that you would have to be proved guilty of a crime for them to remove any of those three things from you. This was a way to ensure that Southern governments did not um, say, oh, okay, sure, they're citizens, but then continue to treat them as slaves. It also said that all citizens are given equal treatment under the law. Now, this is going to be an interesting one because for much of our history going on from here, that's not really going to happen. And so this is going to be a highly contested part of the um, 14th Amendment. This is going to be what is going to um, be utilized when um, segregation is going to be fought in the Supreme Court in the 1950s. It also said that congressional representation would be cut if blacks were denied voting. Um, 
So that was to ensure that they had the right from citizenship of the right to vote, which again would not necessarily be followed by Southerners and would require further legislation. And then it also disqualified Confederate leaders from federal offices, trying to show that if you stand up against the United States government, you do not then get to go back and become part of that government later on. Just a couple of years after Andrew Johnson um, creates his version of Reconstruction, it was really clear that reconstructing, at least the rebuilding of both the the area and also the rebuilding of those governments was going to require some more hands-on work. And that's where we get the Reconstruction Act of 1867, many times considered to be military reconstruction. And it's called this because the South was divided into these five military districts where U.S. soldiers would be stationed in each of those areas to make sure that state things stayed under control. One, it showed um, or required that the states in order to be readmitted, would pass the 13th and 14th Amendments, and they also had to guarantee black suffrage. At that point, the military would then pull out. However, one of the things that was in the 14th Amendment was that they were supposed to have securities for um, black men to have the right to vote, and that was very largely being ignored. So, in 1870, the 15th Amendment would be passed, which gave all men the right to vote regardless of their race or previous servitude. And this was to further ensure that in all federal elections that black men would be given the right to vote. But notice, I said federal elections. State elections were still going to be open to interpretation, and that was probably one of the biggest failings of the 15th Amendment because in many cases, newly freed slaves would be denied the right to vote in more local elections. So from here, we're going to have the Civil Rights Act of 1875. This would require full and equal access to jury service, transportation, and public accommodations. What's interesting, though, is that although this was passed, again, these would not necessarily be fulfilled because this was specifically for federal things, meaning that this has to do with the national government, not necessarily state governments. So within a state, you might actually be denied access to jury service, to transportation, or public accommodations. It was only when you crossed state lines that it became a federal issue, in which case the Civil Rights Act of 1875 would be implemented. This political cartoon that was um, published in Harper's Weekly um, shows a lot of the anger from the, uh, from the former Confederates uh, that came as a result of the 15th Amendment. Um, as you see here on the left-hand side, you have a newly freedman that with the military bill, as noted right here, um, that male citizens 21 years of age or over of whatever race or color are going to have a vote. Whereas the ex-Confederates, due to the military bill, are going to be disenfranchised as uh, for their participation in the rebellion. And as you can see, they have no vote here. And um, it says that they accept the situation, but you can see that on this right-hand side, it is definitely a begrudging acceptance of it. And the other thing I find kind of interesting in this particular image is what's hiding here in the background. You might recognize that. That would be a guillotine. And why the artist drew a guillotine in the background here is to show that this is basically the death or the execution of white men's rights at the expense of black men. And when it comes to the rebuilding of the South, again with this idea of reconstruction, there are going to be people who are going to take advantage of the situation. Um, for example, we are going to see some Southerners who join the Republican Party after the war and support the idea of Reconstruction. These people have a variety of reasons for doing so, many of which are purely economic reasons. Let's get the country back on its tracks. Let's get the economy going. Let's rebuild from the war. Let's make sure that this is something that we can get over. However, by people in the South, they were seen as traitors to their cause.
because number one, they're supporting reconstruction, which is um, not being controlled by Southerners. It's being controlled by the North, as well as these are people who joined the Republican Party, which was traditionally a Northern abolitionist anti-South, in their opinion, political party. The other group are carpetbaggers. Carpetbaggers were the nickname given to Northerners who moved South during Reconstruction. Um, they were believed by Southerners to be taking advantage of the defeated South, that they were taking advantage of the situation and um, economically hurting the country. And they were called carpetbaggers because they traditionally were seen, and you can kind of see it in the background here, seen with a carpet bag or a um, luggage bag with them as they moved south. Um, these two very derogatory terms shows the anger of Southerners towards those who are trying to implement Reconstruction in the South. Which brings me to the topic of the newly freed men and what things were like for them. And they really got to define their own sense of freedom in a lot of ways. For some that um, when they got their freedom, they immediately picked up, left, and went as far north as they could, some actually going all the way to Canada. Many of them would actually leave the area and they would go to Kansas, and these people were known as exodusters. The exodusters went to Kansas in very large numbers, and um, it takes the ideas of an exodus, meaning a huge... Um, movement of people out of one area to another area, as well as the duster part, because Kansas, as we know, tends to be a very um, flat, dry place. And the exodusters were going out to Kansas to be able to get newly opened up territory so that they could begin farming on their own. Some others, they stayed in the South, and there was a lot of violence in some areas towards their farmer plantation owners that they um, destroyed the, the, uh, the tools, they destroyed the homes, and in some cases actually murdered their former masters. However, in other cases, usually on smaller farms, usually on farms that only had a few slaves, some of them actually ended up staying voluntarily and continued to work for the people that they had once been owned by. This was largely, as I said, on smaller farms where they had a much closer, almost familial relationship with their former masters. And you also have to consider, they didn't really have anywhere to go. Okay, now you're free, but you don't have any land, you don't have any money, you have no education, and you basically have no skills. So staying with your former master was at least recognizable, familiar, and you kind of at least knew what you were getting yourself into. You knew what the work would be like. You knew the land. You knew the area. And so at least by staying, you knew what your future would most likely be like. However, slaves are or former slaves are going to find ways to build their own communities. And community was the most important thing for freedmen because they had few skills and no money and um, very you know, few future prospects for themselves, having a strong community was a way for them to build each other up so that they could rise up on the social ladder. Churches were a huge part of this because this was one of the few places where prior to emancipation that they had been able to gather and congregate in a large group. This was already familiar to them. They were already established and these churches were a source of education, a source of food, a source of clothing and medical attention that they did not have elsewise. They did, over time, begin to develop their own schools, as you can see in the background here, a freedman school. And you might actually notice that the teacher, who's kind of in the background here, you can kind of see her right there, um, she's actually a white woman. And that was um, often the case with Northern abolitionist women who would go and work with these uh, newly freed slaves and try to teach them. Um, mainly because so few former slaves had enough education to actually run a school themselves. However, these schools were severely underfunded. They did not have 
um, in many cases, a place to meet consistently. Most of the time, the schools closed down very quickly, and few children actually got an education. But school was incredibly important to these newly freed slaves because they knew it was one opportunity for their children to have a better life. They started to also develop their own social clubs where um, they would get together and be able to enjoy each other's company in a non-work-related, non-church-related location. And as a community, they pushed for Republican candidates because Republicans had traditionally been those that were the abolitionists, those that had freed the slaves, and they tried to recruit voters. But please remember that many Southerners are finding a lot of different ways to prevent them from actually succeeding in voting in local elections. So as the war was winding down, President Lincoln saw the problems that would face these newly freed men. And so he established the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, this particular organization provided food, clothing, health care, education for these newly freed slaves. It was originally led by General O.O. O. Howard, who would uh, later on have a university, um, Howard University, be named after him. And as you might guess, this was very much disliked by Southerners who were um, angry at the idea of Blacks having a voice in local government, having education, and having power within their community. You also have to remember that for poor whites, now they were no longer um, better than anybody else, that they were on the same level as poor Blacks, and that was a condition that they were not happy with. So, as a result, the Freedmen's Bureau was largely unsuccessful. The one thing that they were relatively successful with was providing some level of education for newly freed slaves, teaching them how to read and write so that they would be able to get better jobs. An interesting result of the issue of Reconstruction, especially that um, requirement of taking an oath of loyalty to re-enter the Union, many southern states um, did not have many white men who were eligible for Congress anymore. They had taken up arms against the United States and thus could not hold federal office. So what happens? We have the very first black congressman. Um, on the left here, we have Hiram Revels, who was a Republican from Mississippi. He was the very first black senator and shortly afterwards would be voted in Joseph Rainey, who was a Republican from South Carolina, and he was the first black congressman. And we would see a relatively um, large number of black men entering into Congress in the years immediately following the Civil War. However, as time is going to go on, whites in the South are going to find ways to remove these black men from office and put former Confederates back in office. As I previously mentioned, there are going to be former slaves who are going to be trying to escape the South. Some of them actually are going to escape the South earlier than emancipation, as well as there are going to be some poor whites that are in the South and others that are from the North that are going to take advantage of the Homestead Act of 1862. Um, this said that any citizen who had never borne arms against the United States could claim 160 acres of government land virtually for free. Here were the requirements. Um, you had to pay a small fee in order to um, actually get the certificate for the homestead, which was minimal. This would be, I mean, on the equivalent of today being less than, you know, probably a thousand dollars, which was, you know, not that bad. Then you had to live on the land for five years and you had to improve the land in some way. Now that particular part improved the land as well as the other requirement which was to have a dwelling were really vague um, and this was although intended to entice um, southerners to defect from the south and defect from the confederacy and move to the north what ended up happening was actually this was taken on a lot by the railroads the railroads took advantage of this. They would have their, you know, their workers go and claim a homestead, quote unquote, 
And um, over five years, they would improve the land. How would they improve it? By building a railroad there. As far as a dwelling, well, the dwellings that they many times would be creating would be about the size of, you know, a very small dog house. They would maybe only be a foot tall, um, but there were no requirements in the Homestead Act of exactly how big the dwelling had to be or that it actually had to be lived in. And so it was a way for railroads to get around it. But this was going to be important because there was a lot of uh, government land in Kansas, which is why a lot of African Americans would move there post-Civil War. So as I've mentioned earlier, um, we're going to see the Southerners and former Confederates trying to find as many ways to maintain their traditions and maintain their status quo, especially socially and politically within the South. And uh, we're going to see them trying to keep Southern Blacks, quote unquote, in their place um, after the Civil War ends. Some Southerners wanted to build what they called the New South. And this was a desire to rebuild the South with a much more diverse economy to not solely rely on a single staple crop, the previous one being cotton, and not solely rely on manual labor. And so they were looking for greater crop variety that would allow them to um, kind of diversify. And that way, if one of the crops failed, it wouldn't be a huge deal. And they also wanted to have more industrialization because they realized that was the main reason why they lost. They didn't have the materials. They didn't have the transportation. They didn't have the technology for communication that the North had had. And industrialization was the answer to all those things. However, for the most part, Southerners were not prepared to actually have this new South. They were ready to maintain the old system that they had had before. And we're going to see the creation of Redeemer governments. The Redeemers were white Southern Democrats who had sought to oust the especially black Republican governments in the South. Um, these people many times were... Uh, um, the wealthy, the aristocrats that had lost power as a result of the Civil War and were trying to bring it back. They wanted to find ways to become politically, socially, and economically superior to blacks once again. You can kind of see this uh, view of the South in the political cartoon here. We see two U.S. soldiers, so this is uh, indicative of military reconstruction holding the chains to the solid South, um, who is carrying on her back the carpet bag of bayonet rule. And this is seen as the, uh, the Northerners coming in and ruling and running and, as you can see, ruining the South as well. And so this is a very kind of pro-South, anti-Reconstruction cartoon. So we're going to be looking at the ways that Southerners are going to keep former slaves in economic, social, and political subservience. The first of these is economic, and that is through a system known as sharecropping. Let's imagine that you had a giant plantation. On this plantation, you had many slaves working for you. And then suddenly, overnight, you don't have any slaves anymore. You still have all this land. You still have all of this stuff that you need to harvest, all of this cotton, and you need someone to do the work. So these former slaves have nowhere to live. So you make them a deal. You can live on my land. You can rent the land from me. You already know how to do the job. Now you'll just be working for yourself. And it sounds like a great deal. Both groups are going to win, except for the fact that these former slaves, they don't have the money to get started. They don't have the money to... Um, to, you know, to get the tools and to get the supplies necessary to run their own part of a farm. So the landowner, the former slave owner, is going to go ahead and not only allow them to rent the land, but they're going to front them some money to get started, to get the tools necessary. Then what they're going to do is that they are going to repay them back a share of their crop, hence sharecropping, and um, 
they're going to have um, a share of the crop be part of their um, their pay. But please also remember that they are going to not only have to pay that for rent, but also to pay back for all the tools that they purchased through their former owner. And so now they're going to be severely in debt and they will continue to get further and further and further into debt until eventually they're basically working for free, which basically is slavery, not in name, but in practice. Which brings me to a term that we're going to be hearing a lot throughout the rest of our school year, and that is Jim Crow. And a lot of students don't know who Jim Crow is because thankfully we live in a world post Jim Crow. So Jim Crow was a character that was created in minstrel shows, in these traveling theater shows. Um, that was a characterization of the happy-go-lucky, yet very stupid, black individual. And um, as you can see here, you have uh, a man by the name of Billy Van who is uh, portraying a black man. So you see this in blackface. And that was very common, very popular as a form of, uh, form of entertainment at the time. Today, we would consider this to be highly offensive. But back then, that was pretty much the norm as far as these types of minstrel shows were concerned. And so this is going to be a um, kind of a racial tradition that is going to then be the name given to a series of laws that are passed at this time. Now we have black codes and these were local laws that were passed to keep freedmen in a subservient position. Um, they were banned from juries, they were banned from holding local office, they would be arrested for quote unquote idleness, in other words, not having a job, which who is going to hire a former slave? No one. No one's going to hire a black man. So many of them are going to be arrested for idleness. Um, and notice that these are many of the things that were protected under the 14th Amendment as well as the Civil Rights Acts. And yet they were not being followed by the states because they said that those laws only applied to federal elections and federal crimes and federal juries. And so this was a way for them to remove the rights of blacks in America. We also have the Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws were laws that created segregation of the races in public places, places like schools, railroads, restaurants, doctor's offices, you name it. Um, and so this is the, the, the set of laws that will be fought later on in the 1950s during the segregation uh, civil rights era. The Jim Crow laws are going to be the cause of one of the most important Supreme Court cases in our history, and that is the case of uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. The man you see right here is Homer Plessy. Homer Plessy was one eighth black. Um, that means that one of his great great grandparents was black. Um, and looking at him from this image, he does not appear to be African American. And um, that was on purpose, that he was going to be the person to test this. It's really quite incredible. So it was understood that um, there was supposed to be equality among the races and that all citizens should have equal access to things like transportation. Well, that wasn't happening in reality because of these Jim Crow laws. And on a lot of the railroads, there was a white car and a colored car. The white car usually was enclosed, it had food, there were drinks that were available. In many cases, you were able to have a sleeper car where you would be able to, um, almost like a, a hotel room on the actual train so that you would have a place to sleep in comfort. The colored car, sometimes it didn't even have closed windows. Sometimes it didn't even have a roof. In many cases, it was just an open railroad car. They sat on wooden benches that didn't have backs on them. It was incredibly uncomfortable. It did not have the same facilities as the white cars. So Homer Plessy was going to test this. And he sat on a, uh, in a white car on a railroad that was going to be traveling from Louisiana into another state. And they did this specifically to test the federal law. And... He was asked to leave the white car because he was black. 
and it goes up to the Supreme Court when he refused and he was basically kicked off the train. It goes up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that as long as the facilities were equal, it did not matter that they were separate. And so this doctrine of separate but equal is going to be what operates our racial system in the South for the next 70 years. Socially, the most influential way to keep Blacks from feeling like they had any sort of power or um, uh, ability was um, the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan, also sometimes referred to as the Invisible Empire of the South, was founded by Nathan Bedford Forrest, um, as well as a few other former Confederate soldiers. Um, he is their first, what they call, Grand Wizard of the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan. These men would um, dress up in sheets, dress up their horses, so that they were unrecognizable, and they were trying to maintain the social status quo in the South. They used terror and violence in order to keep the social order. Um, they murdered many, many people, especially those that tried to register to vote. And this form of terror was very successful in keeping blacks in a position of subservience to whites in the South, especially poor whites that otherwise would not have access or not um, not be considered to be on the same social scale as the rest of whites in the South. Politically, they were going to be able to keep um, blacks from voting, um, to disenfranchise them through a couple of things. Um, one of these are poll taxes. A poll tax is literally a tax to go to the polls. In other words, it is a tax to vote. This was implemented because they knew that most Southern Blacks did not have the extra money in order to do so. The other one was a literacy test. This was a test that would require you to prove that you could read and write. And considering that most former slaves did not have the ability to read or write, this prevented a huge number of them from voting. Now, the literacy test in particular was very popular because their, uh, their belief was, well, hey, if you're not smart enough to be able to read and write, then you shouldn't be able to vote, which is somewhat a logical explanation. But you also have to remember, there are a lot of very poor, very stupid white people in the South as well. So how do we allow them to vote but keep blacks from voting? That's where we get the grandfather clause. The grandfather clause said that if your grandfather had been able to vote, then you are able to vote. And so this was obviously not capable for pretty much all Southern blacks. Their grandparents had been slaves, so therefore they were not exempted from the rule. But stupid white people, they were definitely exempted from the rule. Now, what's amazing though, is that this was not always just in the South. This also was used in the North to keep many immigrants from voting as well. So where do we go from here? How do we um, view Reconstruction today and how did it affect people immediately following those first few steps of Reconstruction? First of all, women were pissed. Um, Pre-Civil War, women of all races considered themselves to be enslaved in a similar way. You might remember us watching the video of um, the, the speech by Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman? And she was making the comparison between enslaved black women and white women in that both of them were enslaved to white men. Many of these white women, especially those of the middle classes, were highly involved in the abolitionist movement seeing it as morally reprehensible, trying to end this, this horrible system in the South. And they were extremely successful in it. When the war ended, however, they were angry because they were overlooked in the Reconstruction Amendments. The 14th Amendment establishes the citizenship of those former slaves, and the 15th Amendment specifically stated that you could not deny someone the right to vote 
based on their race, their color, their creed, or previous servitude. But the one thing that it did not do was say that you could not do it due to sex. And so these women were angry because now former slaves, black men, have the right to vote. And yet educated, middle-class, upper-class white women were still denied suffrage. And so there is a huge movement for women to now demand the right to vote. They are now already politically active because of the abolitionist movement. They know how to be heard. They know how the system works. And now they are going to bring the issue of women's suffrage to national debate. Little side note here and something that you can put onto your westward expansion maps. Um, shortly after the war was over, we have the purchase of Alaska from Russia by the Secretary of State William H. Seward. And this was called to be Seward's Folly. And they called it Seward's Folly because everyone thought this was the dumbest thing that we could possibly have spent our money on. We spent millions of dollars to buy this frozen wasteland. And they had all kinds of great names for it. They called it um, uh, Wall Russia and Frigidonia. Um, and these kind of silly names were, were made up because they were trying to show how ridiculous it was to buy Alaska. But Seward got the last laugh because shortly after they bought Alaska from Russia, gold was discovered in the territory. And there was a huge rush to Alaska. Lots of money was found, almost as much as there was found in California about 50, uh, 15 years earlier. As I said at the beginning of our lesson here, Andrew Johnson was not very well liked by Congress. And Congress was just looking for a reason to get rid of the guy. Um, and so what they ended up doing is they passed a law called the Tenure of Office Act. This said that for any person that the Senate had to approve to get their position, only the Senate could remove them from office. Basically, the president couldn't fire anybody that the Senate had actually given the job to. And they did this because they knew Andrew Johnson hated the Secretary of War, Edward M. Stanton, who was a very radical Republican. They had so much conflict that Congress was just waiting for him to fire um, Edward Stanton. And he does. After the Tenure of Office of that Act is passed, Andrew Johnson still fires Edward M. Stanton, and that's exactly what they were hoping would happen. They impeach Andrew Johnson. Now, I want to make it clear. To impeach the president does not mean that they are going to be removed. To impeach means that they are put on trial. And so Johnson was put on trial for... Um, basically going against Congress and thus going against his job as the president of the United States. It goes all, I mean, all the way down to one final vote. And he was one vote shy of conviction and removal from office. A couple of people voted against their party, voted against the radical Republicans because they were afraid that by impeaching and removing the president from office, it would set a very bad tone that we would remove any president that didn't do what Congress wanted. And that was not really a tradition that they wanted to allow to happen. So as you might guess, in the next election, Andrew Johnson's not going to be nominated. And, um, the Democrats are instead going to nominate Horatio Seymour. The Republicans are going to nominate General Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant is going to be well known for waving the bloody shirt. And what this is, is it's basically in his campaign. He keeps kind of reminding everybody that, hey, don't you remember? I'm the guy who won the war. Hey, don't you remember me? I'm the guy who kept the union together. And it's called the Waving the Bloody Shirt because it's kind of this like very visible reminder of his place within the war. And so he wins by a landslide and it's probably one of the biggest mistakes America ever made. 
because although Grant was a fantastic military leader, although Grant had done a great job keeping the Union together and ending the Civil War, he was a terrible president. His period as presidency is going to be known as the era of good stealings. Not a title that you really want to have as president. So they have a whole bunch of scandals that are going to occur during his presidency. The first of these is going to be known as the Credit Mobilier Scandal, which has to do with the Transcontinental Railroad that um, you covered over the Thanksgiving break. Now, there were two halves of the Transcontinental Railroad. The first half of the Transcontinental Railroad was going to be the Union Pacific Railroad. They are going to be making the way going westward. The other one would be the Central Pacific Railroad, and they would be moving eastward, and then they would meet in Promontory Point, Utah. Now, this particularly has to do with um, the Union Pacific Railroad and the funding for it. Um, this actually goes all the way back to when Abraham Lincoln was president, um, but it's going to come to surface when Grant is in office. Um, when the Union Pacific Railroad was chartered in 1864, the federal government um, and Credit Mobilier, or this construction company known as Credit Mobilier, was established. Um, during Johnson's pre presidency, a congressman by the name of Oakes Ames had distributed shares of Credit Mobilier stocks to other congressmen in addition to taking cash bribes. Um, this story was then broken by the New York newspaper The Sun during the presidential campaign of Ulysses S. Grant when he was running for re-election. And basically, this scandal had been going on in the background in Congress for many years. And although this was happening even when Lincoln was president, the fact that it came to light when Grant was in office is going to tarnish his administration. The second of these is the whiskey ring. The whiskey ring was not much better. Um, this particular one had to do with tax revenue and conspiracy among government agents and politicians, the whiskey distillers and the distributors themselves. Um, it began in St. Louis and spread to many other major cities throughout uh, the United States. Um, it was mainly a group of Republican politicians who were siphoning off millions of dollars in federal taxes on liquor. And there was a whole entire um, network of bribery going on among distillers and the storekeepers and internal revenue agents and congressmen. And uh, when this broke to the American public, it very much tarnished Grant's administration because although he was not directly involved in the ring, he came to be seen as kind of like the, the emblem of uh, Republican corruption. And any other uh, scandals, especially one that happens later on with his Secretary of War, just kind of confirms that this is a corrupt administration. And it's going to be furthered by the Panic of 1873, which the president was not directly involved in nor responsible for, and yet he's going to be blamed for it. So here's what happens. If you recall, we had those greenbacks that had been put in place at the beginning of the Civil War under Lincoln to take the country off the gold standard as a way to um, allow the government to have money to run the war. Well, now it was time to put the country back on the gold standard to make our money safe and stable once again. And that is where Jay Gould and James Fisk are going to come into play. Um, these two men wanted to make sure that they were able to make as much money off of the, um, the greenbacks as possible. And so what they did is they actually got in touch with um, President Grant's brother-in-law and somehow convinced him to give them inside information of when the president was planning on switching over from the greenbacks over to gold. And so what they did is when they found out that it was going to be, um, they were going to do the switch over, Jay Gould and James Fisk began to go and buy as much gold as possible. And they bought it and they bought it and they bought it and it was super cheap. And then they went ahead 
and the greenbacks were removed and they went back to gold. Well, now what this does is that there is less gold in the system because of Jay Gold and James Fisk, and thus it makes the value of gold super, super high. The problem of that is that there's not enough money to replace all of the greenbacks. And thus, the value of the American dollar plummets, and that causes the Panic of 1873. That, along with over-speculation in railroads as a result of the Homestead Act and a ver variety of other issues, but a lot of it is due to James Gould, or Jay Gould and James Fisk and the gold hoarding that they did um, with the inside information that they got about the replacement of the greenbacks. Um, the Panic of 1873 severely injured both farmers and industrialists alike. It hurt the country overall and um, was going to be a while before the average American was able to revive from the panic. Those that were on the wealthier side were not as uh, affected because their money was diversified. But for the average American who relied on the American dollar, that was a, a pretty severe blow. In 1873, we see the slaughterhouse cases, which were the very first interpretation of uh, the 14th Amendment by the Supreme Court. Um, as a reminder, the 14th Amendment had to do with uh, the uh, citizenship of newly freed slaves and kind of this broad definition of citizenship. The short version of what the slaughterhouse cases did is it very much diminished the power of the 14th Amendment. It basically said that the 14th Amendment only applied to federal law and federal issues and really did not apply to the states and in-state laws, which allowed for things like the Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws to develop and to um, become the norm in the South. We have the election of 1876, and this is the end of Reconstruction. In this election, we have Rutherford B. Hayes, pictured to the right, um, running as a Republican versus Samuel Tilden running as a Democrat. Unfortunately, there was no clear winner in the Electoral College. Um, Tilden and the Democrats were counting the votes of all of the states, especially those that were in the South. Hayes and the Republicans were not counting the votes of those in the South because some of those they felt, A, were not legitimate um, because they felt some of those were being voted on by former Confederates, but also that some of those states had not yet officially been admitted back into the Union. So there were two election results, and thus neither one officially won because they considered both of them to have won. And so for quite a while, we end up with no president. And so we have eventually the Compromise of 1877 that kind of officially ends Reconstruction. The deal was struck. The Democrats would allow Hayes to become president with the promise that as soon as he became president, he would end military occupation of the South and essentially end Reconstruction. It was so important to the Republicans to ensure that a Southern Democrat did not enter the office of the presidency that they were willing to allow the end of Reconstruction. They figured that... Um, that things were going okay, that enough had been changed, that there were these federal laws that would protect the former slaves, and so everything would be just fine. And they could not have been more wrong. The heritage of Reconstruction is a pretty bleak one. Um, to many in the South, the shame of Reconstruction was actually worse than the war. It was military occupation by the North, it was adding just the insult to the injury of losing the war. At least they lost the war fighting valiantly. They lost the war, um, you know, fighting to the very bitter end. Reconstruction was a slap in the face to them. They also are going to breed generations of animosity between the North and the South. In fact, in many Southern places, they still... Uh, will call the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression. And so that just right there gives you a very clear view that Southerners still in some ways are fighting the Civil War and still are angry about Reconstruction and how that went down.
also with Reconstruction, although slavery had been abolished, although technically slaves, uh, former slaves were now citizens and men, all men, regardless of their race, would have the right to vote, their condition didn't really change. And in some cases, it even got worse, considering that at least when you were a slave, there was the protection that you were expensive, you were valuable, and so you were protected from the worst types of work. You were protected from extremely brutal treatment because they needed you alive so that you could continue to work. When slavery ended, those protections were gone. Now, blacks were the target of animosity and anger by poor whites who now were struggling to um, get work against blacks who were also trying to get work. And since African Americans were willing to work for less, a lot of Southern whites were now facing the fact that they didn't have uh, enough money and that they were sliding down the social ladder. You also have the fact that Southern blacks uh, were now given the right to vote and a lot of whites found that to be so intimidating and so threatening that they put things in place to stop them from voting, to stop them from rising up the social ladder. So things like the Ku Klux Klan. So you had fewer protections, you had fewer benefits after the war and after slavery than you did before. And that's probably one of the saddest results of this is that the goal of the Civil War um, was to end the issue of slavery. And what we resulted in was even worse conditions for those that we had tried to help.